Welcome to the AT Parenting Survival Podcast, where you get help and guidance through the chaos of parenting a child with anxiety or OCD. This show is for educational purposes and is not intended to replace the guidance of a qualified professional. Here's your host, child therapist, Natasha Daniels. Well, hello there, and welcome to another episode of the AT Parenting Survival Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about the misconceptions that parents often have when they're going or trying to find anxiety and OCD treatment for their kids, or whether they're already in there. Your expectations, you know, are your, are they where they should be, or are your conceptions of what therapy should look like, are they accurate? I'm excited that I am not going to be chatting to myself and to you and talking to the wall. I've actually invited two amazing therapists to join me in this discussion. I reached out to Anxiety Specialists of Atlanta, and I talked to Dr. Josh Spitonic and Marty Munford from his team, and they always have so much wisdom. I've had Josh on my podcast, I think a few times, and I love him. I love his style. I just think that he's just so down to earth and has a very nice, clean, simplistic way of explaining things about anxiety and OCD and about kids. He gets it. He's a parent in the trenches, and I love when people have real life experience. And I just met someone from his team, Marty Mumford, who seems obviously whoever he's going to hire is going to be very much similar to his style. She's very relatable and seems very well seasoned in this stuff as well. So I'm excited to maybe collaborate and work more with them and with her. But I think you're going to find that their expertise and their wisdom and their experience is going to really add some depth to this discussion. Before we get started, though, I do want to thank NoCD for sponsoring this episode. NoCD offers affordable, effective, convenient therapy. They are available in the U.S. and outside of the U.S., and you can schedule your free 15-minute consultation to see if NoCD is a right fit for you and your child. Just go to treatmyocd.com. That's treatmyocd.com. I will leave a link in the show notes. You're also probably going to want to reach out or learn more about Josh's practice and his team. And I'll mention this after we talk, but I want to mention on both sides of the interview, you can check them out at anxietyspecialistsofatlanta.com. That's anxietyspecialistsofatlanta.com. I'll leave a link in the show notes. They also have a YouTube channel that has a video version of their their PDF, the 25 tips for parenting your child with anxiety or OCD. And they've made a video series of those. And that's really awesome too. And so I will link that in the show notes so you can catch that as well and watch that. Let's. go into our conversation. Well, I want to welcome two amazing people from Anxiety Specialists of Atlanta onto the show. Thank you for coming back on. So Josh, you've been on before and Marty, it's good to meet you. I've actually met you once before, but it's good to have you on the show as well. Yeah. Good to be here. Awesome to be back, Natasha. Yeah. I love chatting with you. You know, I feel like we're just so aligned in like styles and it seems like Marty's similar too. So it's just good to have like-minded people on the show where we can just have a really good conversation about how to help parents who are raising kids with anxiety or OCD. You, you know that we love all the networks you're a part of and all the support you do for the parents out there. We refer to you and your services and your platforms all the time. So we appreciate just the space that you're in as well. Oh, I appreciate that. I did introduce you before I brought you guys on, but I'll give you an opportunity just to talk a little bit about who you guys are and what you do. Sure. I'm, I'm Dr. Josh Spitonic. I'm a licensed psychologist. I'm board certified in cognitive behavioral therapy. I'm the practice owner of Anxiety Specialists of Atlanta. We're heading into our decade, our 10th year, Natasha, of being in, in practice in Atlanta. And we provide services to uh, clients and families in over 35 states around the country. And I have what I think is the absolute best team in all of America, but I'm sure if you had other practice owners on here, they might, they might argue, but I have an amazing group of psychologists, licensed professional counselors, social workers, just the best staff that specialize in treating kids, teens, and adults across the lifespan of all anxiety disorders and OCD. And I have with me one of my best, Marty. Want to introduce yourself? Yeah. So I'm Marty Munford. I'm a licensed professional counselor, also practicing with Josh at the Anxiety Specialist of Atlanta. So I ditto everything he said. It's a great team and we're just dedicated to bringing evidence-based interventions to families. And like Josh, I am also a parent. And so this is something that is especially near and dear to my heart because parenting is really, really hard. (laughs) So the more I can bring hope and 
hopefully good research uh, to inform parents in their parenting their anxious kids. Uh, that's my real passion and goal in my own practice. Yeah, I love that. And that's the goal. You know, parents need resources, they need support, they need evidence-based approaches. And so um, I love the topic that we're going to discuss today because I haven't talked about this before or not directly, but there are some big misperceptions I think that parents have about what anxiety or OCD child therapy should look like or their expectations of it. And so we're going to discuss that today and just having like kind of a clinical discussion with three therapists and what we what we all notice. Because I think if parents can go into therapy with realistic expectations, the whole process will go much smoother you know, in general. Couldn't agree more. In fact, that's, that's kind of probably the best start for Marty and I to even begin this discussion, which is the parents are intimately involved in treatment is our hope. And in many practices around the country who specialize in pediatrics or kid populations, parents and families, caregivers are actively involved in the treatment process. We know that's not the case everywhere, but it just seems to us kind of unthinkable to be involved in working with a, a kid, even a, even a teen, prepubescent or 14, 15 year old, we're not working with the system at some point. And for us, the systems are the caregivers, whether it's, you know, biological parents, adopted parents, step parents, caregivers, grandparents. It's something that we believe in. And whether it's, you know, session one, session five, session 10, I know we do a lot of work with kids directly and sometimes just without the parents in the room. But just to discuss having parent actively involved in the process, I think is a critical part of doing really evidence-based and thoughtful and compassionate uh, treatment for kids who have anxiety and OCD. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's definitely a misconception that we're going to just meet with your kid and then send them on their way. But I also think that another aspect of that is sometimes it's a barrier to treatment, right? I think parents are afraid that they're going to come in and we're going to tell them all the things that they're doing wrong. And parents are really scared of that moment. And I think that if we take that title of a misconception, I think the biggest one is if we ask you as a parent to make some shifts and you must be doing something wrong. And I don't think that's true at all, right? I think that parents are a big part of this process because like Josh said, this is a symptom issue. And that may mean that you're doing nothing wrong. It's just not working for your family. So we need to make some adjustments. And I think between the belief that, hey, this is a them problem, so we're going to send them off to the therapist. And then also the kind of fear on the parent side that we're going to say, here's X, Y, Z things that you're doing wrong and need to change um, instead of looking collectively at how do we make all of this work better for your kid and your family? Yeah. And those are do those are two really good points because I do feel like there are some families that drop and run. <laughs> That's kind of what I call it. I remember one time I had this mom, she dropped her kid off and this was like a decade ago or whatever. but. And he was so angry and I had never met him before and she just never came in or anything. And she sped off because I had a really like I was right in the parking lot and he was like almost violent with me. He was so aggressive and I had no number to call her. I'm like, and I had to tell the guy, I was like, I'm not going to force you to do therapy, you know, but it just that's like that's my like realistic drop and roll, you know. Well, I think parents come in with different expectations of are you treating my child? Are you treating us? Are we involved or are we not involved? And our clinic is probably not different than most out there where we will do an evaluation or an intake, a, a single first meeting, almost exclusively just with the parent system. We will then have a second session definitely with the child, um, with the parents, of course. But when I first started practicing Natasha, and this is going back almost 25 years, I would often do kid intakes. And this is not kids at the age of five, six, seven, I'm talking like 10 to 15 year olds with just the child and, you know, with the parents being involved at the beginning and then parents come back at the end. And over the last 10 years, with a lot of the interventions that have come out, that really do a lot of wonderful focus on parent focused interventions, whether the child's there or not, we might discuss those today. I know you've discussed them on, on podcasts and a lot of your resources. Parents are critical in this process. So we love meeting with parents and caregivers at the outset and knowing that we're going to get to the, the kid inter interaction at some point. This is kind of a, a nod or a, a throwback to um, you've been very gracious on your podcast and your Facebook channels about um, sharing our resources, some of the resources that, that Marty and I have put out there, uh, a document, um, Raising Resilience, 25 Tips for Parenting a Child with Anxiety or OCD that we wrote two, two years ago. IOCDF put it out there and we've done a, a YouTube series on it. Our very first note on that 25 tips is that, which is mom and dad, parents, you're not the problem. You're actually a critical part of the solution. And so we believe that from the very beginning, from the first phone call to getting them in for treatment, that we want to see the parents and the caregivers at the beginning, 
no matter what shape your kid is in, just so we have a better understanding of what's happening, what your needs are. In this case, with that mom, maybe Natasha, your frustration level, you're up, you know, how upset you are and what are we walking into? And so I just think that's really good, healthy and, and trust building practice to start with the caregiver and parent level. And we believe that that's an integral part of the first phase of treatment. Yeah. And if that expectation is I am an integral piece of the puzzle, you know, like how my stress level is, what I do and my kids want me to over accommodate or are stuck in an OCD loop um, or trying to avoid because of anxiety. And I like what you're saying about that shift of, you know, like what Marty was saying, it's not, you're the problem. And so if you go in understanding, I'm going to be a component of treatment and it's not because I'm a problem, but it's because this is a systems issue. You know, it's like treating one arm without the other arm, like you're not going to make progress. I think that's a good reframe. I do also want to say this episode isn't about this, but as we're highlighting misperceptions or misconceptions, you might also be, you might already be in therapy and might be like, well, that's not happening for me. And even though that's not the topic, we'll touch on that periodically. Like that is something that you should request. If you're not seeing that, then it's something that you can actually request and make happen. If you have a flexible therapist to say, I want to be part of it. I want to learn what I'm supposed to do as far as pulling back my responses parents need coaching. And that's, I think that's a key. And you guys obviously think that's a key part of treatment. Just because the therapist isn't doing what Marty and I are going to recommend. And there's three therapists here on this podcast, Natasha, me, you and Marty, we're recommending things that we believe are very effective and helpful and, and research-based, but not all therapists do this. And that doesn't mean you're getting inferior quality care. Mm-hmm. It just means that, like you said, I, I believe if you, you can advocate for your needs and advocate for what you want from the therapist. And most therapists, you know, they're willing to accommodate and be flexible with that. If that's going to get the end result, which is the family and the child in a better place, uh, most therapists are going to work with that request. I think that's a pretty natural thing to expect, but not all therapists are going to do the things that Marty and I do, and that, that's okay too. Well, and you can take a team approach, right? So I think that's a common thing that we're starting to see more and more in our practice is that a child is working with a therapist that maybe they've got great rapport, maybe things have been going really well and they're seeing progress, but sometimes that therapist has noticed, or maybe the family noticed themselves, that there is a parent component here. And they don't want to disrupt what's already going on. And so we may work in tandem with another therapist to be sort of the parent coach. Usually we're using the SPACE model from Dr. Leibowitz, um, which is supportive parenting of anxious childhood emotions. And so there's ways to kind of pull together a collective approach that meets that need. And so the, the biggest sort of tragedy of that would be for the family to say nothing, right? And just say, man, I really wish I knew more what was going on, or I really wish I was a part of this. Or worse, you know, being in that tension moment, you know, we were even discussing this before we started recording, right? That there is these constant tension moments with your kid of when do I push and when do I wait? And if you're not in those conversations, you don't get a lot of guidance on how that might affect or inform their treatment. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. So what other misconceptions are you guys seeing? So the one that I think I'm most passionate about myself is the idea that they're coming to therapy to make their kid calm or the idea that if your kid is experiencing distress, then there is something wrong. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so I think that's a huge one because one, you know, Josh and I were talking a little bit about these topics beforehand too, and how it kind of all leads back here too. Cause one of the other misconceptions that we might see in terms of, you know, is my kid distressed is that idea of, Like, how quickly can we get to a tool, a task, a coping skill, something that feels very intervention-y, right? And if we're assuming that every sign of distress is a problem, it's going to massively affect how you feel your kid should be doing in between sessions, right? So if we can kind of get that baseline understanding of there is a level of distress that comes with life that we want people to have because that's the total human experience it's going to definitely change what our goals are and it's going to inform how and when we use intervention. Yeah, that's such a good point because how many times, maybe this, I don't know, but I'm sure this has probably happened to you guys. How many times do you get a call or an email from a parent after doing exposures in session or they're doing exposures at home and they're more, I've had parents who are more stressed than actually their child because their child is feeling some discomfort around the exposure, or they're still talking about it, or they're now wanting to do compulsions and that expectation, you know, to set out in the front, on the front end of why, why discomfort is helpful, why learning how to sit with those struggles is helpful, I think is so key. 
it, it's why every nurse and pediatrician in America, when you get your booster shots or your vaccines, they say your arm is going to probably be sore for a few days because when you're, you know, obviously if your arm starts turning colors and stays away for too long, call your pediatrician. But when they tell us your arm is going to be sore for a few days and we believe that's what's going to happen. And if it's not great, my arm's not sore. But if my arm is sore for a few days and they told me that I have nothing to worry about. It's that same sort of preventative idea here, which is tipping off to families and kids that we're going to be doing some really tough things that require bravery and courage. But doing that, which is what Marty discussed, is going to actually intentionally bring some distress to the experience. That's actually expected. We actually want that. That's what builds resilience. We're not doing things that are dangerous or unethical that are designed to ruin the day, but they're going to leave a little bit of a, you know, a lingering discomfort in the, the equivalent of the arm and just know that's going to happen. And if you're prepared for that, And you know that the way your child struggles for the rest of the afternoon, maybe for the next few minutes, maybe the way you're watching it and feeling your own distress, those are expected outcomes. And I'd ask then, what do you do when you're feeling a little bit of extra distress when the moment's over? And that's just another great place for intervention, which is planning for those moments when the moment is done, whether Natasha used the word exposure, whether it's a live accidental exposure, or you intentionally try and bring some anxiety to your life to increase bravery and resilience. When that moment's done, sometimes we feel like poo-poo. It just happens. And so if you're prepared for that, the, those lingering side effects are not so scary and not so uncertain. And when you know that, then that immediate call to the therapist, what do I do? What's going on? Doesn't feel so required. So I think just a little bit of education to the kid and to the parents about this is what we're going to be doing. These are some of the things that might happen afterwards. And if that happens, totally expected. And that at least, you know, is a little bit of prevention kind of medicine. And there's definitely a developmental lens to look through here, right? I I get this kind of question a lot, or I get patients calling after they've graduated from working with us because kid has a meltdown or kid has a tantrum, right? Those are the words that often get thrown out when parents are really worried that maybe everything is back and they forget that sometimes you have hard days. It's okay to just have a hard day. It's okay for that day to exist and not be pathologized either. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And I think also, kind of going back to to what we're talking about, sometimes when parents are pulling back accommodations or doing the space program where they're the ones like just doing the work and pulling back accommodations in general, whether it's space or the child is starting to do exposures or doing brave things, sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. Yeah, I like the analogy of the shot, you know, because, you know, sometimes you feel really bad. You, sometimes you get cold symptoms, you know, sometimes you're in bed for a day with a COVID shot. And so I do think, but it's, you know, you're doing the work. And a lot of times I think parents and and kids will bail early, early, early in treatment because they're like, this is making it worse. My child's distressed now, or they're having more compulsions because we're talking about OCD, even just educating them on OCD. All of a sudden they're going home and that's all they're doing is they're like compulsing all day. And they're like, this is terrible, but it's, you're stirring up that beehive. So, so let's, let's go back to the very beginning of therapy. We've gotten beyond that intake that I talked a little bit about, about involving the parents. Marty and I talk about one of my pet peeves or things I'm most passionate about. And I think any anxiety specialist, no matter what your age is, anxiety and OCD across the spectrum of all the disorders would say this. The first intervention, Marty referenced like interventions, which is a kind of, the first intervention is not treatment. It's education. Mm -hmm. And every therapist in the world knows, and this is probably across all disorders, Natasha, but anxiety is so true. We're talking about physiological symptoms and the way our mind races and understanding the difference between things that are scary versus things that are dangerous, understanding the the timing of therapy and what we're going to do and exposure therapy versus interventions that don't use exposure. And is exposure therapy dangerous and scary and unethical and all those pieces? Intervention at the beginning of therapy for anxiety work is all about education. It's educating who's going to be involved the level of involvement, what you're expecting is going to happen, the dosage of therapy, maybe how many sessions it might take to get to the sort of active intervention, but education at the outset is critical. And that involves educating people about what works and what doesn't, what your treatment choices are. Exposure therapy is not something we do with every single person out there. And um, what the possible side effects and lingering effects of doing these kind of interventions are, including what positive outcomes you should be expecting. And when those things happen, talk to your therapist, talk to us. So we know, are we you know, traveling across the path of what we think is going to be happening or for deviating, we, we can correct, we can be flexible, but educating everyone involved, all the stakeholders involved, even a five and six and seven year old about what to expect and what we're going to do, I think is a really neat and important way to start to level set the expectations and also sort of calm some of the fears that every parent's going to come in wondering what's going to happen, 
what are we supposed to do? And really what happens when this thing happens? I think a lot of that can be addressed early on in the first few sessions about education of symptoms, management, and what intervention is going to look like. That early intervention uh, about education, I think, goes a long way for the whole first phase of treatment. And I think with that, too, that idea of active intervention, right, that is one of the biggest, I think, misconceptions is that we're going to walk in here and, you know, the words that I hear are coping skills or tools, like give them coping skills, give them tools, right? And I don't think the parents even know really what they're asking for, but they really want to feel like there is a a tool, a hammer that they can walk out of that session holding and they know what to do now. And we do have to kind of drill in that idea that, to Josh's point about the psychoeducation, not only is that active intervention, there are patients who show progress before you ever have to do the whole pit of snakes Absolutely. exposure kind of thing, right? And so our goal is to not have to pull out as much of that if we can. And there are patients who get better when they have an understanding of what's happening in their brain, in their body, what's happening in their family system, knowing how all those pieces interact with each other. Sometimes that on its own can be enough. And so it's not even just that psychoeducation is a prerequisite before you can get to the active stuff. Sometimes it's as impactful or more impactful than the let's let's get your suds level up. Let's talk about being scared. Let's do the hard thing. Yeah, I think a lot of parents come in wanting to get to the skills, skill building, you know, um, give me something quick, re- reduce their distress and this is a good point that the the educational piece is therapeutic. I mean, I have also had kids who've had, especially with OCD, like weird OCD themes, you know, weird in quotes, you know, based on no one understands it. And mm-hmm. they learn, oh, this is what scrupulosity OCD looks like. And then all like 80%, 90% of their symptoms go away because now they feel like, oh, this isn't me. You know, so there's there's a brief period of relief there. And that educational piece in general is so huge. And Sometimes I think parents want to rush it. You know, they're like, why do you just keep talking and you haven't really gotten to the the skills yet? And to understand that the educational piece is therapeutic and necessary. And I always tell kids and parents, we're going to build long-term skills, like, and it's not going to happen overnight. And I want your child and I want you to understand why we're doing these things. And I think they're kind of expecting square breathing, just teach me square breathing, you know, teach me like, they just want like really fluffy, you know, those are good ancillary supports, but they're, I think that that's what they want. They want like a workbook of just, you know, yoga poses and, and to understand the deeper value of anxiety and OCD and how to navigate that throughout life is, is going to be much more in depth. Well, and even just looking at what you just said, right. If their main goal, and I don't blame them, right. I hate seeing my kid in distress. I hate it. But if your main goal is reduce their distress quickly, that's a compulsion, right? You've just landed at, you have compulsions and safety behaviors, right? And that's what they do. They pull away that distress and make you feel safe for a second. And we are looking to expand past that. And and sometimes that can be a good empathy builder too, right? If the parent knows what it's like to just want relief for them so badly, it can help them, you know, borrow the experience of what it's like to know There's this little way that you can maybe reduce your distress for a hot second, but long-term, what creates growth for you? Not that. Yeah. I I think to be fair also, Natasha, you're talking with two other anxiety specialists. That's the name of our company, Avalanta, but you're an anxiety specialist. 95% of pediatric specialists out there are not anxiety specialists. They are therapists, counselors, psychologists, social workers, school counselors. And so- 95% 95% of the, the population, if, if this was just professionals listening to this podcast, I know it's more for families and, and kids and people who have a lived experience directly, but if this was just a podcast for professionals, 95% have never seen exposure therapy, have never seen things that are directly about facing fears head on. And so breathing and holding on to rocks and you know crawling up like a turtle and working on your turtle shell and the 54321 method is what a lot of therapists and by the way again like you said they're ancillary we use them in our own practice as well these are sort of like side moments of you know getting control and take care of yourself but if they're the sole level of intervention as as marty said it kind of feels like a cheat a little bit like a compulsion you don't find out what happens at the end of not doing that which is you're going to be okay and that's learning to be okay not being okay which is a phrase all of us anxiety specialists use so I think when parents and kids come in expecting for that quick, you know, squishy ball or, or fidget spinner to calm them down, 
it's coming from a place of that's what most therapists have in their therapy office and their therapy drawer and their therapy closet. And you sort of mentioned weird stuff in OCD. Most of the stuff in OCD is weird and sticky and nuanced. And, and so a lot of us, you know, we'll, we'll use those interventions just to teach someone some basic self coping skills. But the large intervention is teaching kids and parents watching their kids resilience, grit, mm -hmm. bravery, courage. And that's doing really tough stuff that most adults don't want to do. We're asking little ones to do it. And when little ones do it, they're amazing. And they're having fun. We, we actually, I know this is, this is a podcast here, but the, you can't see the video, but just this weekend, we had a beautiful event in our parking lot here in Atlanta that we called, it was called Fear Fest. And we had, we put visuals out on Instagram and Facebook. We had an amazing event here where we had probably 30 to 40 families show up. These are all families that either we had seen in the past or that we're currently seeing. And we had five, six, seven booths of weird, gross, creepy, funny, silly booths of social anxiety and sticky things and weird food exposures and touching odd things and trying new things and poppets that you step on and all things that are designed to teach kids bravery and courage but by having fun, rewarding them and doing activities that may not have looked therapeutic because it was in, on the weekend, Natasha, with a bunch of tents and handing out donuts and cookies and you know lemonade. But these kids were doing the most brave things that we would do every day in our therapy offices. And to be fair, most pediatric therapists don't do those kind of things. So I know where it's coming from when someone wants the quick fix to learn how to basically physically calm down. And that's not a bad thing, but we know long-term that doesn't teach the skills that someone's going to use long-term to not only address them in the moment, but to prevent them in the future. Yeah. And that is, it's true. I mean, that is what you're most likely to get depending on where you're going. And, and that is, that's a very common therapy approach. And I think it's, for parents to understand, especially if hopefully they're getting an anxiety or OCD specialist, because that's really, I, I really drum that into people, especially for OCD, but I think even for anxiety, that it's, no, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And we're teaching our kids, we're not working on how do we get this seven-year-old to self-regulate and not be anxious, but how do we get this seven-year-old to be able to function at 27? You know, that's my goal. And that's my goal with my kids too. It's like, and so that's a slower process, but it sticks um, because I'm not there rescuing them. My daughter, I mean, she couldn't even drive. I thought she would never be able to drive and her social anxiety was so bad. And even just filling out a college application was such a huge thing. But you know, it's this slow process of working on that and letting her kind of struggle a little bit and not rescuing her. There's a Starbucks, you know, coffee waiting for you if you just drive there, you know, and just teaching her to inch her way. And now she drives in LA, which I wouldn't do. And we had an issue on a cruise where I packed her shoes. This was the worst social anxiety exposure for both of us. I packed her shoes and they had took our they took our luggage already. And we were like, we were getting off. The boat was, it was done. And she's like crying. And I could have offered her my shoes, honestly, because we're the same size. But my social anxiety was like, there's no way I'm walking around this boat without any shoes on. And she because she had built that resiliency, you know, and had learned those skills long term. She went down by herself and, you know, cried to the front desk and asked them if she could borrow someone's shoes and she got through it. And I think that's what we're trying to teach our kids is like, how do you, how do you handle future struggles? And that's that, I think understanding that and the ex expectation of therapy, no matter how old your kids are, can be really key. Yeah. I, I think almost thinking, I like to explain it to parents and intake that my goal here one is that you never have to see someone like me if you don't want to again, right? Because we're not treating a dog phobia or contamination fear. You can copy paste any fear in the middle there and they know what to do with their approach, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you will be chasing your tail your whole life if it's let's figure out how to handle not having our shoes on a cruise ship, right? But mm -hmm. when we can say, okay, what do I do when I'm feeling awkward or out of place or like I made a mistake, right? And how do I cope with that? Then next time it is something else, a job interview, right? To your point about them being 27, is it a job interview? Is it applying to grad school? Is it asking somebody on a date? It doesn't really matter what the thing is. You know how to recognize the symptoms and you know how to show up in a really tough moment. It's time we put help directly in our kids' hands. Introducing Crushing OCD Course for Kids and Teens. It was way more helpful than all the other therapy we've ever done because we didn't really know 
what to do. So we weren't really doing it before. So the course helped to figure out what the exposures are and how to do them. We're not in therapy and find it really hard um, to find an ERP trained therapist here. Um, so we're currently with like the public health service, but again, they don't seem to be trained in ERP. It's filled that gap that we don't have that was desperately needed. This was really well timed for us to use between therapists and to help us like start get off to a good start with this new practice. It was easy to use. Um, I was able to do it from my phone or also on the computer. There's different ages, you know, so there were younger kids, there were teenagers. And um, so that was really nice too, to have a variety of ages where it wasn't just geared towards younger kids or older kids. It was a nice variety. It's helpful for our kids to hear it from this like third party as opposed to just us saying it. I really like the offense and defense method. I love working on poking at OCD while it's sleeping. It makes it a little bit easier to do and it's kind of fun. <laughs> I'm planning on using it to work on my uh, fear of like holding or touching batteries and stuff like that. So it was really helpful and I think a lot of other kids would like it. I thought that I was like the only one who had worrying about the weather and stuff. And then there was somebody else on there who worried about the same thing, which was really helpful. Seems less scary to work on stuff now that I've watched this class and I'm more interested to work on it. I like trying to do more exposures still and going to, before I wasn't, I just didn't want to do them. I've worked on some of my bigger compulsions and been successful. I realized that it was helpful to do like the exposures before it was like really, really hard. It's still hard, but it's helpful to know that I need to do them. Before there would be a lot of battles about it. So it is definitely less loggerheads. Really, really good course and super helpful. I definitely would recommend this. It's really easy to follow. It's in nice bite-sized videos. I really like the worksheets that go along with it. And I think it's really helpful. To learn more about this course and register your child or teen, go to atparentingsurvivalschool.com. So what other misconceptions do you guys have? I got one regarding rewards, which I <laughs> love bribing children. <laughs> what, what a neat way to get kids to look like superstars in therapy. And if we did it more at home as parents, we'd probably be even more successful. But <laughs> rewards are expensive and we, we, we're all fearful of teaching our kids the wrong lessons. But on the topic of rewards, I always find it funny when parents say, but aren't you just bribing my child? And my answer is, I absolutely am. But what if they game the system and just do certain things to get the rewards? And my response is, you're welcome. <laughs> because the only way you get a reward on a good behavioral you know, conceptualization, when a good behavioral therapist understands what the reward is worth, if the child's going to try and cheat the system to earn the reward, I'm thinking I'm now shaping the child, which really, by definition, I'm shaping the parents to shape the child to act in a certain way. I love doing that. There's no shame in a child acting in response or in, in search of something good. In fact, when you think about sort of psychology 101 stuff, anxiety is all about doing things to avoid bad, doing things to avoid yucky, doing things to avoid uncertainty, doing things to avoid gross, disgust, fear, whatever the thing is. And that's called negative reinforcement. We are uh, trained like puppy dogs to act in a way to make sure nothing bad happens. And that's why we do rituals, compulsions, safety behaviors, avoidance. So anyone who struggles with anxiety or OCD has already been trained in their own brain system to be highly responsive to negative reinforcement, acting so nothing bad happens. Our job is to you know, engage in some neuroplasticity, to make the brain a little bit more flexible, to get the kid to act in anticipation of something good happening. So A, using rewards in bribery and therapy, I find to be a very positive way to engage parent to child, having fun about it, being excited about it, talking positive about it, dangling that carrot in front of them, no shame. The goal is obviously to eventually fade it out a little bit, but using rewards is just teaching the child to be focused on some other outcome that's more positive and more rewarding. So I think it's a very good thing, but it also does te teach the child to think in a different way about outcomes. And we are so focused on not something bad happening and trying to avoid that. Getting a child to focus on something good happening and acting aligned with that, I think is a very positive thing to do. So I just like the focus of rewards and therapy, and I'm not afraid of kids you know, cheating the system or gaming the system for rewards. I think it's a very good thing. Um, it's just finding the rewards that are appropriate for your family, for your bank account, whether rewards are you know, financial or you know, money at some event or $5 gift cards. And then the next part of rewards is always fun to me when a parent says, you know, my kid really is not rewarded by anything. 
as they're snuggling with their parent on the couch. And I'm thinking, oh, moms and dads, your kid mm -hmm. may not be rewarded by monetary things and concerts and, and sporting events and toys and shirts, but your attention is rewarding to them. So when a child says, I don't want anything, there's nothing I need. As the child melts down and the parent you know, gets involved, I, I see what the reward is. And so sometimes the reward is not monetary. Sometimes it's not something you can get with tickets and coins. Sometimes it's parents' affection and attention. And I think that's an important thing to address as well, which obviously I would probably do with the child or the teen not in the room. But moms and dads, caregivers, you guys sometimes are literally the reward. And for anyone who has a child with ARFID, social anxiety, selective mutism, separation anxiety, sleepover fears, trust me, when they say, there's nothing I want, I just want to be home with mom and dad, there's the reward. So I just want parents to be a little bit more creative and therapists to be more creative about what rewards are, how to use them, obviously how to fade them out so you're not just bribing the kid forever. But using rewards, I find to be a very kind, fun, and engaging way for the parents, the therapist, and the kid to have a lot more fun in therapy. Because despite bravery and courage and fear that we're working on, Natasha, therapy with kids should be and could be a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, and Josh, I would say too, uh, you know, yes, we don't want to be dangling like a trip to Disney World in front of a kid forever, too costly. But we actually don't, I don't feel like we ever really fade out the carrot. We just transition it to a bigger why, right? I mean, the truth is nobody would do anything hard if they don't have a big enough why. Like if you go back to what you said earlier about the shots, no one would stick their arm <laughs> and get sore for two days if there wasn't a reason to do it, right? But the problem is, I think with kids, and, and even in work we've done with adults, I think this is often true. Anxiety can really blur up the idea of what's important, right? And help establish that why. And I do think that, uh, to your point, knowing your kid's currency and being able to meet it is helpful. And I always ask parents, would you work if you didn't have a paycheck? Probably not, because work's exhausting and you're tired and maybe your kid's keeping you up all night. And if no one was paying you to be there in the morning and do your job, you probably wouldn't go, right? So it's it's human nature to need a why. The problem is your kid might not see the why it's important to go to a birthday party or why it's important to sit with the uncertainty of an intrusive thought. So in lieu of them knowing their why yet, let's give them something that is important to them so they can justify doing something that's really, really hard. And unless the parent wants to go do a bunch of hard stuff just for kicks, then let's not expect the kid will either, right? Yeah. And I think it's a good point because you know, we're asking them to go off a cliff and expect that the parachute is going to pop out. And to get them to that cliff, we need some enticing. And one, I do agree. I think therapy should be fun. It should be exciting. It should, it's for kids. And two, I feel like it's hard to move that dial because kids live in the here and now. They have tunnel vision. They don't see this is going to impact me in college or I'm not going to, this is going to grow bigger and the, you know, my issues are going to be harder. And so when we can entice them to take that extra step and then, okay, you're off the cliff and now the parachute is sailing, you survived, you're good and we do that over and over, then intrinsically it becomes more hardwired. And yeah, then you move the needle and you have to earn this for a harder thing. You know, it's constantly moving. But I do, I hear that these are good ones you're picking because, you know, there's there's a lot of parents who are very, there's like, there's niches and themes that go on in parenting, you know, in, in the parenting world. And there is a, there was a lot of movement and there still is, I think of like, we're not rewarding you know, we're not rewarding our kids yeah. and we're not going to have a reward system, raw screen, you know, CPS model. And I think that's a hard shift for parents that are coming in with that philosophy, coming into an anxiety OCD therapist and talking about rewarding them for one, you get the parent, not raw screen parents, but parents who are just like, why should they earn something for sleeping in their own bed? Every other kid does it. So you get the more like old school parent, you know, I'm not going to reward them for things that other kids can do by themselves. Um, but then you also get on the completely other side of the spectrum, parents who are, you know, following kind of like gentle parenting or raw screen or, you know, parent, uh, kid led parenting. I don't know, whatever is in vogue right now. And I think it's to understand that this is different. It doesn't matter philosophically where you're at, but that to get them to go over that cliff, these incentives are really going to move the dial. And I even actually interviewed Ross Green to get him to tell me that it is OK in in this relationship to have incentives to offer your kids. Um, as long as what I have found with my kids is one, they're starting to make the association of I'm doing this really awkward social anxiety thing and I'm getting rewarded. And so that A plus B equals C, that Pavlovian response is actually getting rewired of, 
you know, talking to a stranger means Robux. And so I have, there's now there's this positive connotation to talking with a stranger. And two, I feel like my kids then naturally progress. We're like, now they can do that. And they don't need me to give them any carrot. It's like, now we're on to the next thing and the next thing. And most, most kids get that. I mean, even though I talked about, you know, fading it out, most kids recognize at some point, these rewards are not going to be continued. But as, as Marty said, rewards as parents to child do continue. They continue for different reasons, for different whys, and they get bigger or smaller, and they're more developmentally appropriate. And we find different times to, to give them out. But one of my favorite, listen, I'm, I'm 20 years ahead of Marty professionally. She is twice the parent therapist I'm, I'm going to get to that point is the, the next misconception the second i want to share this in our 10 video series that we did natasha on raising resilience one of my most favorite things marty said just to give her so much credit on this she said we're here to change not the symptoms but the system and that sounds like i don't know marty if you made that up if you heard this somewhere i thought how have i never said that phrase before it was brilliant which is parents who are coming in who are exhausted and beaten down by their child's anxiety i mean being a parent we all know it's tough parenting a child with anxiety it's exhausting it sucks the life out of the room. Often, if, there's, if that's not the only child, you know, that becomes the identified child for a while, if it's not weeks or months. As parents, we feel deflated and frustrated and we don't feel like great parents. And so we're asking them to come in and reward their kid for stuff that, as you said, Natasha, kids already do. We're trying to change a system. For some reason, something right now is not working, parents. And if we can help you change the language, the energy, the tone, the good mojo in the house that if that one tiny thing changes and you're not looking for their good behaviors which is hard to do when there's so many bad ones we're so stuck seeing if you're not looking for that one good behavior to then give them a reward and we've changed that tiny part of the system i'm sorry but that's a huge shift in family functioning whether it's around the dinner table or going to sleep or school stuff so when marty said we're here to change systems we are really trying to as anxiety specialists change the system the energy the language in the home to focus on all the things your child can do that are brave, that are courageous, when we're you know watching nonstop all the things that we don't want them to do. And as, as parents, we're constantly nitpicking. I, I'd ask any parent, and I'm calling myself out as well here, Natasha, watch yourself at the next five dinner tables. If you actually sit down with your kids at dinner, watch the next five dinner tables, how many kind things you say to your child and how many nitpicking, annoying things you say to your child. And just count the math on that. We have conditioned ourselves to be really hyper-focused on all the things they're doing wrong to shift even a little bit in the direction of what they're doing right, I think is just a real beautiful, positive shift in, in, in the family functioning. Another misconception I wanna throw in there, and I'm saying this just to bring not, uh, Marty and other people to the forefront, I'm very proud of being a psychologist. I'm a board certified psychologist. I'm in the top 5% of all psychologists because most of us don't do that. An anxiety specialist is a different breed of therapist. And uh, we get calls all the time when people wanna see the psychologist or the senior people on our team. And I will tell you around the country, and I want all parents to hear this, you don't need a psychologist or the, or the most seasoned or, or oldest person on the team to see your child. In fact, people can't see, but with my gray beard, I, I, you may not want me. You may, you may want a more young, energetic therapist, but a licensed mental health professional. And even if you're working in a specialty clinic like ours, where you have pre-licensed people who are surrounded by anxiety specialists, who are talking all week with each other about, in confidential ways, the people they're working with, how to really refine the interventions, about the science, about the interventions, going to conferences, reading the science, presenting the science. I just really am, am very passionate about getting access to care. And we know that therapy for kids with anxiety and OCD, it's hard to find, it's expensive, it's, it's expensive, and it's not always the most accessible, even with telemedicine, telehealth. So I just wanna put out there that as someone who's very proud about being a psychologist and running a big clinic here, our anxiety specialists here, to me are, I'm going by Josh on this podcast, are, are credential agnostic. Finding an anxiety specialist is important. Finding someone who knows the science and the research of anxiety, cognitive behavioral therapy, and those kind of interventions is important. Their credential doesn't matter. And so you find a 20, 20 year seasoned therapist who doesn't know about exposure therapy, doesn't mean they have to do it, but they don't know about exposure therapy or interventions that are aligned with cognitive behavioral therapy. I might offend someone, Natasha, but I'm running. We don't even refer to clinicians who don't acknowledge cognitive behavioral therapy as the leading intervention for pedi pediatric anxiety, even if they don't do exposure therapy. And so I just want to acknowledge to parents out there that when you're looking for a therapist, you can go to the International OCD Foundation, you can go to our website. Most websites like ours talk about how to find an anxiety specialist for your family, for your child, for your teen, for the adult. And that credential is not as important as their training and their education. I would put Marty in front of any family, school, synagogue, or professional conference in the world because of the training she had before we met, the training she's done here and the leadership that she takes off on our team ahead of any P 
PhD who's been doing this for 20 years who doesn't know about these sort of interventions. So I just want to address that misconception that seeing a doctor or a seasoned therapist is actually may not, may not be the most important therapist for your child. Seeing someone who specializes in anxiety interventions is actually, for me, the most important element you're looking for. Understanding that training can mean different things for different people. Yeah, that's a good misconception too. I see that all the time in my audience where parents are like, what degree do I need? Like want to see, you know, I, I want to see. And they'll actually, sometimes if they're really not knowledgeable, they'll say, I want to see a psychiatrist. Yes. <laughs> you're like, okay, they don't even do therapy. So you're like, I like that credential agnostic. <laughs> you know, I like that because you're right. I would rather send my kid to anybody who I know has been trained properly to treat anxiety or OCD and is using CBT or ERP for OCD than somebody who's been in the field for 30 years because it's a very specific skill set. And there are a lot of newer therapists that are getting amazing consultation and have a solid team around them. I mean, Mike, I would have my kids see anyone on your team because I know you have a solid practice. And I've actually talked about that with my kids. I'm like, you know, we can find other people to help you. And I think it's a unique skill set. And I so I think parents are looking at and we have all sorts of things after our name. I'm an LCSW. Marty, you're an LPC, NCC, you know, and we all have like, and these are all just like, you know, alphabet soup, but it's, you want someone who is a licensed mental pro- professional for sure. But then what, what other training have they had? And is it specific to anxiety or OCD? Well, and I think we have a, a lot of work to do in the provider community too, of becoming more specialized, right? I think that people think of therapy as a very generalist perspective and that can be also kind of keep people from getting the care they need, right? I see this a lot in, you know, I'm in all those you know, mom groups that are both helpful and terrifying on Facebook. And I see all the time people in my community and I'm just there as a mom. I'm not there as a therapist, you know, I'm looking to get my child a therapist. Can anyone recommend someone? And people jump in and they're all giving names. And that's great that they had such wonderful experiences, but it also, we know nothing about this kid or this situation. And so I think a lot of times there becomes a big mismatch of this worked for this other person. Surely they're great for my kid. And people are forgetting that, you know, if I said, I need a great doctor for my kid. Okay. Are you going to take them to see a gastro or are you going to take them to see a dermatologist? Right. Can both of those people probably look macro at whether your child is healthy? Hey, that's for the pediatrician. Right. Or do you need a specialist? Right. And I think that's another way that we can kind of educate the community a little bit better about if you are looking for a trauma specialist, what are the things you'd want to be doing? Or if you are looking for someone who is going to specialize in BFRBs, right? What is the type of training that you need to look for? And so for us as anxiety specialists, that's where we want to make sure people understand, here's what makes us anxiety specialists. Yeah. I don't think you can't keep up on research with every little thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think Finding someone, I mean, I always just skip the pediatrician and go to the specialist because my insurance allows me to do it. I'm like, if my son's having issues, I'm going to go to the urologist. We're going to go to like, you know, the endocrinologist. I'm going right to the specialist. And I feel like mental health is the same way. I don't even feel comfortable treating body-focused repetitive behaviors, BFRBs. Um, And even though that's in the world of anxiety and OCD, there are special approaches I haven't been trained in. I don't feel comfortable training in them. I don't like that topic. And so um, I deal with that at home. I rather send my child to someone who specializes in body focused repetitive behaviors. And so finding that expertise is really helpful. And it is tricky. I mean, luckily with SciPact, we're getting access more to more therapists. I was on your website earlier this morning and I said you were like available in like 30 states. It's like 30. We just we just launched a brand new website two weeks ago. So I'm pretty excited about it. But yeah, we're we see people in over 35 states now, which is exciting. I mean, that's amazing. Over- overwhelming and exciting. Yeah. So, I mean, that's like more than half the country you can provide services for. Yeah. This started happening pre-pandemic. I think the pandemic probably expedited it with a lot of states and some of the holdouts are the classic ones like California. Uh, I think New York is still holding out, but it's about increasing. This is your whole, your podcast, your network, your Facebook, your YouTube channel, which I'm going to just say, well, I, I absolutely, I mean, my family's pro therapy. My family's benefited from therapy and my family has used your podcast and I've talked about it and your YouTube channel plenty in private discussions and public. Y- you are increasing access to evidence-based care in the best possible ways. And, and I know you're a, a beautifully humble person and you don't put yourself out that way, but you are probably 
the most right now impactful person in, in the, at least North America on parenting the anxious child. Whether people access your services or not, that's up to them. We promote it all the time, but increasing accessibility to affordable and evidence-based care is what our team is about. This is not a, a marketing thing, Natasha. We are busting, it seems like every clinic, we don't need new well, clients and families, but we offer free support groups throughout the month for kids and families, adults and teens. We offer low cost group therapies online and in person. And I got, I'm trying to grow the, the team of all teams. You know, I'm, I'm not a hospital system, but we have 23 anxiety and OC specialists seeing all ages. So I say we're not an aged practice, we're a topic practice. We do anxiety and OCD, but your, your network, everything you do is about increasing the good information out there to as many people who can hear it. And I just admire you for that. We're doing this in our you know, corner of the United States and SciPact has allowed us to see people across state lines using video stuff. But you know, seeing a five to seven year old on video with parents, it's not easy, it's not fun, it's, it's not the most engaging, but, it, but if we're gonna be the effective therapist for you versus no therapist, I'm all in. But if I can get you someone close to home that you can see in person once in a while, I mean, Marty and I love seeing people in person, seeing people on video is something we will do if it increases your availability for services. But I'm a big believer in for anyone under the age of 12, I'd love for you to be in office with your therapist. That just may not be financially or logistically practical. So it is what it is. But what I'm not in favor of is not getting care, not getting help. And so I'm just a very pro-therapy kind of person professionally and personally. I'm pretty public about my family and our challenges we've had with our kids with anxiety and stuff. And I'm all in. But um, seeing people in 35 states is a privilege. It's one we don't take lightly. So when people reach out to us from afar, you know, we're honored. But ideally, you're seeing someone in your, in your own backwoods. That's just not a realistic opportunity for a lot of people around the country. So it's, it's wild to say that we do that. We see people in 35 states. We have people living in three different states. We have people in Ohio, Illinois, and Georgia. But yeah, we have staff that can see people almost throughout the country. And it's a, it's a privilege that we do not take for granted. I think and kind of going to another misconception there too, and, and why finding a specialist is so important. I think there is a misconception that you're going to be in therapy once a week, forever. <laughs> right. And and that's what therapy needs to look like or should look like. Um, and I think that's a barrier to treatment for a lot of people because they assume it's in, it's inaccessible when it might not be. And so our goal is actually to be able to help as many families as possible and preferably to get to the point where they never need to see someone like us. And so the more resources that are out there, the more solid psychoeducation that's available to families for free or for low cost, right? The better. And, you know, I think people will pursue therapy more openly and be more open to seeing a specialist when they're not thinking about how do I build a relationship that I have to commit to forever for my child or for until they graduate from high school, instead of being able to see this as something where you can learn and you can understand and you can improve and move on with your life. Right. And so I think all of those things too are, are major misconceptions that walk in our door at intake is a lot of overwhelm of what am I really committing to? And they don't see this as something that can be treated and improved. Yeah. It's definitely far from the psychotherapy of lay on my couch and we're going to do psychoanalysis for 20 years. You know, it's skill building. And I do think like a lot of times I'll get a lot of emails and calls from parents who want, they're like, I just want someone in the East Valley. <laughs> you know? And that just really bothers me. I don't know why. I'm like, and I'll normally respond a little bit like snotty. I'll be like, anxiety and OCD therapy, pediatric anxiety and OCD therapy is like finding like a unicorn. And so if you have to drive across the valley for 60 minutes, that's hitting the lottery, you know, because it is hard. And I would much rather for someone to see someone in your practice or another practice that is anxiety and OCD specialized than being in person five miles away because it's convenient and it's local and they see kids and they treat everything. And I have worked, I mean, I do a lot of damage control. I mean, so much of my work right now in the AT parenting community is picking up broken pieces of incorrect therapy and the damage that it's caused um, the child and the family and then connecting them again to good quality therapy like your practice. And so I feel like I'm I'm almost more of a social worker really at this point where I'm disseminating information. I mean, I think my roots are really starting to show, you know, both literally and figuratively, you know, like I'm just trying to educate the world so that we are getting more therapists who are like, oh, like I get a lot of therapists that reach out to me and be like, I, I don't know anything. You're making me realize I do. where can I get some extra training? You know, so that, that knowledge piece of like, oh, there is some specialized, there's a need for specialized training, both for therapists and for parents. And also to know that whether you're getting the right kind of treatment or not and, and finding that right treatment. I think that damage control piece, Natasha, is hitting me in the heart because we spend 
almost as much time bringing new clients and families, kids, teens, and adults in here as we do getting people placed in the proper place somewhere around the country. I have a practice manager. I have three directors, two clinical directors, and a community engagement director. I have a staff of 23 therapists. And we spend a lot of our time behind the scenes that no one gets paid for and that no one gets acknowledged for and no one's giving five-star reviews for or one-star reviews for, for all the social work and advocacy that we do to get people to the right place. And I'm very firm about this. I don't care if you come to see us. I just care that you get seen by somebody if you're in need. And so sometimes that means you're not going to be seen by our team either because we can't get you in or because we don't have the right skill set or because you want a 7 p.m. appointment because you don't want your daughter to miss ballet. Well, if I can't accommodate that, but here are the clinics I, I swear by. I can't tell you about their pricing or their availability, but I would trust my own child to go to. And so we spend a lot of our time putting out fires, answering misconceptions on phone calls and over emails, having free consultations all the time and getting people to the right place because Unfortunately, if you're not inside the mental health system, it's hard to navigate. You know that. And so, Natasha, you and I are blessed to have colleagues around the country that we can hop on a Facebook group about or put an email out and probably find someone in almost any corner of the country. But most families and, and people with lived experience, they don't have that accessibility and access and information. And so, you know, uh, it's again, it's another thing that we don't take for granted. I, I'm grateful that people put their trust in us to be either their health care provider or for us to get them to the right health care space. And for Marty and I, like we want people to get the most effective short term treatment as possible so they can move on with their lives. And if we're able to help you do that somewhere else, I'm as happy as if you do it in my practice, because getting great therapy is life changing. It truly is. Yeah. Well, I will leave. Hopefully you won't be overwhelmed. <laughs> I know you guys are busting at the seams, but I will leave a link. In Every the clinic show. is. Yeah. I mean, I think then that's parents need to understand, you know, there's just not enough practices, but I will leave a link in the show notes for your practice and your resources um, and your groups and your YouTube channel, because I think you're just producing like invaluable resources and support. So I appreciate you both coming on. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Natasha. Yeah. Thank you, Natasha. I could talk to them all day long because what they say is just so accurate and so on target and a lot of wisdom there to share. So again, I will link their YouTube channel so that you can watch that a series that they have on 25 tips for parenting your child with anxiety or OCD. Um, I think it's really good takeaways on that. And you can check out their website, which is anxiety specialist of Atlanta.com. So definitely check out their resources, reach out. If you're, if you're in Atlanta, that would be the absolute first stop for me. If I was even in a state next to them, that'd be my first stop. And to be honest, I know they said they would rather that you see someone in person, but there's only a handful of, of child like pediatric anxiety and OCD therapists that I would want my kids to see, and they are top of the list. So I hope that you find them helpful, and I hope that you find these resources helpful. If you're enjoying the podcast, don't forget to hit a star and rate it. It actually really does help have the podcast kind of bubble up and be relevant for other parents who need the support. If you have a few extra seconds and you leave a review, you know I appreciate that, and I'll be reading it on air. So don't forget to find the sparkle in everything you do, and I'll talk to you again next Tuesday. Take care. Thank you for listening to the AT Parenting Survival Podcast. To get additional support raising a child with anxiety or OCD, visit Natasha's online school of on-demand classes at atparentingsurvivalschool.com.